everybody, it's Ajanette, and I'm here to go chapter four lecture on ANOVA. I'm just going to share my screen. So we're going to introduce you to ANOVA. Um, I'm going to just stay in the slide, the slide viewer instead of launching it because when I launch it, it kind of interferes with the Zoom. So um, just for ease of recording purposes, you'll know that I'm just leaving it in slide viewer. So when we talk about ANOVA, ANOVA is, it stands for Analysis of Variance. So Analysis of Variance. And we, thus far, we focused a lot on means and looking at mean differences. Now we're going to look at variance differences between groups. And that's going to be really important understanding um, ANOVA moving forward because there's so much variance in a study and we want to kind of dissect that variance and analyze the variance and figure out how much is due to uh, just individual differences between participants or error and how much is just due to our actual, um, our actual independent variable or a treatment effect. So analysis of variance is in fact a hypothesis testing, just procedure, just like all the other tests that we've learned so far. So ultimately our goal for all hypothesis testing is to make, to draw inferences about our population based on the sample data that we're using. And this particular test we use, it can be used when we're looking at differences between two or more groups. But for the purposes of this class, we will only use ANOVA for three or more groups, and we will use t-tests for two or more groups. But from a formulaic standpoint, I want you to know it absolutely can be used for two group comparison. Additionally, we're gonna have one independent variable or grouping variable that is nominal in nature, so they're only different in name only. And then we will have a dependent variable that is scale. And as you know, scale means it's either ratio or interval data. And so just like you learned with t-tests, there were three different types of t-tests. They were all comparing two groups. There was a single sample where you were comparing a sample to a population. There's an independent measure. You are comparing two groups to one another with different people in both groups. And so that was a, a between subjects design. And then there was a repeated measures T where you were comparing two sets of scores, but they were measuring the same people twice. So the same group of people were being measured repeatedly. And that's why it's called a repeated measures design. And that corresponds to a within subjects design where the same people are in each group. And so we will no longer be comparing to samples to populations. So when you're comparing a sample to a population, you have two choices. That's your z-score when you know there's standard deviation for your population, or your uh, t-test, single sample t-test when that information about the population is known. Now we're going to focus on still continuing over this concept of either using a between subjects or within subjects design and then applying the right technique to the right design. So just like with t-test, an independent measures design goes with a, with, with a between subjects and a repeated measures, t, or excuse me, ANOVA goes with a within subjects, okay? So independent measures ANOVA goes with between subjects, repeated measures ANOVA goes with, with within subjects. So you will have either option, a repeated measures or a, an independent measures. Also, depending upon how many IVs you have, um, tells you what type of ANOVA you're gonna use. For the purposes of chapter 12, we're gonna focus on a one-way ANOVA. One-way ANOVA means there's only one independent variable. We're also going to switch up your language and your terminology. So we will no longer really reference them as an independent variable or a grouping variable. We will reference them as factors, okay? So uh, the number of factors in a study tells you how many independent variables you're investigating. Additionally, instead of looking at what we call conditions, right, 
or you're in the experimental condition or you're in the control condition, we refer to those as levels of the factor. So every factor has a number of levels. Uh, it has to have at least two levels to qualify or two groups to qualify for an ANOVA, but for the purposes of this class, we will use it when there are three or more levels or three or more groups. So let's take you to some other terminology changes. First of all, we know an independent variable is something that you manipulate and that's specific to experimental designs. So we use that variable to create treatment groups, right? That's why it's also referred to as a grouping variable. We also call it a quasi-experimental variable and it's quasi-experimental when those groups already come preformed and we're not randomly assigning people to groups, for instance, gender identity. I can't randomly assign people to gender identity, but I can in fact randomly assign people to what drug treatment condition they are in. Are they in the placebo? Are, in the, are they in a low dose or, or are they in a high dose group? So I get to decide that and manipulate how many treatment conditions I have or how many levels I have, um, and I randomly assign who's in what condition. For a quasi-experimental variable, I don't have that ability to manipulate that. They come preformed. I can't control someone's gender identity. So um, we now reference the, both an independent and a quasi-experimental variable are what we call factors. So the variable that we look to create our groups from a statistics language, we call those a factor, okay? Um, factor can be used to describe both an independent variable for experiments, quasi and independent variables, and it might also be referred to just any other grouping variable, which is the means by which we compare groups, right? Uh, and then um, the level is exactly how many subgroups are we breaking them into. Are we creating just a placebo for a control group and an experimental group? Are we going to have a control group and two experimental groups? Are we going to have three experimental groups? So we decide that as researchers how many factors are involved. So if we had drug as our factor, we look at how many levels do we want placebo, um, do we want a 500 milligram, a thousand milligram? That's entirely up to us, okay? So we determine how many levels and how many factors we're gonna study within a design. For the purposes of this class, we're gonna keep it simple. Chapter 12, we're just gonna look at one factor and one dependent variable, and that's it. We will, the most simple, uh, ANOVA that we'll look at is with just three levels or three conditions in that factor, um, but it can be as many as you want. But the more levels you have in that factor, the more complicated the math becomes, the more complicated the analysis becomes, because we're going to learn about what we call post hoc analyses. And if you have five levels, you have to do a post hoc analysis for every possible combination. So comparing one to two, one to three, one to four, one to five, two to three, two to four, two to five, three to four, three to five, and four to five. And that becomes a lot of post hoc analyses. So we'll start out keeping it simple with just three levels, one factor, and one dependent variable, okay? You, and when we um, are looking at designs, they have different names. So you'll find this when you go to research methods, you are gonna have to describe um, the design of your study. Any factorial design, a single factorial design means there's one single factor. A factorial design um, means there's more than one factor. So if it doesn't say single factorial, that implies there's more than one factor. It can be a two-factor design where there's just two factors or two independent variables, and we don't know how many levels are yet. Or it can be a factorial design that has three independent variables or four factors or five factors. But when you see factorial, it typically means more than one, unless it's a single factor design, and then it's only one IV or one factor.
what we use to analyze a single factorial design statistically is a one-way ANOVA. So one-way ANOVA only has one factor, uh, and it can have three or more conditions. And we are going to first focus on an independent measures one-way ANOVA. Just by saying that, I'm telling you that it's got one factor and that there are different people in each group, okay? And so you have to know what the language means. We are going to, in the next chapter, introduce you to a one-way repeated measures ANOVA, where you're gonna have one factor, but the same people being measured repeatedly, uh, also called a within subjects design. And you're also gonna be introduced to what's called a two-factor design or a two-way ANOVA, where you're gonna have two independent variables and they can have um, also the same or different numbers of levels for each variable. And you analyze the effects of each of those variables on the dependent variable, as well as the interactive effects of those two variables on the dependent variable. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into chapter 13. Right now, we're just planting seeds. So I want to keep it simple, and I want us to focus right now on single factorial designs that are one-way ANOVAs. Furthermore, I want to keep it simple and focus on independent measures, one-way ANOVA. When we're looking at an ANOVA, what you're seeing is usually we have three or more groups. Uh, and so each of these samples has a corresponding population. We already know from what we've learned so far that the sample is typically a good representation of the population, particularly if your sample size is 30. Now we know that these samples are a little bit smaller, so they may not be, they may not approximate the population as well as a larger sample might. We already know that based on what we, we learned. But from sampling distributions, we know that the larger the sample, the closer it gets to normality and the more accurate it represents the population. If we're seeing mean differences between the samples, then we can also likely infer that there's mean differences for the populations, okay? And so then we have a treatment effect. So when we're doing this kind of comparison, looking at differences between our three treatment conditions or our three levels, right, then we have two possible outcomes. We have either the possibility that there aren't in fact any treatment effects, that these differences merely occur because of some unsystematic random factor or because there's just inherent differences between the groups themselves, or number two, we can conclude it's because of our treatment. And that's what we're gonna test mathematically. So ANOVA, one-way ANOVA, is gonna let us get in and dissect that and see if the treatment di differences uh, reach a threshold of significance that allows us to conclude within our assigned alpha level um, that the treatment differences are, that the differences are due to a treatment effect, okay? So just like with any hypothesis test, we have to start from the basis of the null hypothesis. So everything is centering around the null in our formulas because we can, we can test the null, okay? And our symbol for our notation for our null continues to be H subset zero, right? And when we're saying there's no differences, we're just saying the means Remember, null hypotheses are always written in terms of uh, population parameters. So we always use our parameters when we're writing out our null, okay? And when we're writing out our, our alternate hypotheses, statistically, okay? Typically in, in the real world, when you're doing research, we don't write it out like this. We don't use statistical notation we actually write it out in words what our hypotheses are, okay? And we typically center around the alternate hypotheses, also called the research hypotheses, okay? So 
Um, anyway, we don't see any differences, meaning our means are going to equal one another. We're not going to see significant differences between those means. In an alternate hypothesis, we're saying, okay, it's not the null, so they aren't all equal. Or we can literally write out saying they don't, none of them equal one another. Or we might expect that one and three might equal one another, but not two. Or maybe one and two might equal one another, but not three. And whatever the existing literature shows us, and whatever underlying theory is driving our research question, will also then drive our research hypothesis. For the most basic ones, we're gonna use assuming the null is they're all the same, and the alternate is that they're all different, okay? So um, let's move on and talk about some other um, qualities of your F-test. I'm gonna say right now might be a good time to take a break. So if you're already feeling a little bit you know, like this is a lot to take in. Now might be a good time to take a break. Um, write some notes out, do some reading, go back and maybe um, fill in your notes a little bit. Get up, go for a walk, go take a break and get a snack or a drink or whatever you need to do. Um, but now is a good time. I'm going to dive a little bit into dissecting the formula and that might, um, that might add a lot more overwhelming uh, data and information your way, okay? So just pause. Um, ideally, pause me in a way that I, my face doesn't look completely distorted, okay? Okay. Moving on. <laughs> okay, moving on. Okay, so um, if you took a break, welcome back. Let's talk a little bit about the F test itself and the formula. And I'm gonna just pop over to my notes, okay? The F test is really just an expansion of the Z. Remember we started out with the basic Z test and our Z formula is, um, let me see if I can just move it. Great. Our Z formula was looking at mean differences between our sample and our population. Well, actually mean differences, our first formula was looking at mean differences between the participant and the rest of the group divided by the standard deviation. Then we expanded that and we said, okay, we can also use these to look at how a group differs from the population. So we looked at mean differences between the group and the population, between the sample and the population, divided by standard error, which was the reasonable amount of difference that can be expected between the sample and the population. And that's what we used when we're comparing a sample to a population but we have to know, in order to calculate standard error, we have to know the standard deviation for the corresponding population. That information is not always available to us. And that's when we would use a single sample t-test. And the t-test, looking at this formula right here, the t-test actually um, is still the same structure. Its mean difference is on the top. How does the sample differ from the population? And instead, since we don't have the, the standard deviation for the population to plug into our standard error formula, instead we use an estimated standard error that now substitutes sample data in place of population data. And so we're still looking at mean differences between sample and population divided by error, okay? Um, and what is just kind of a standard reasonable difference to expect. Our, our F formula, F test is the mathematical test that we use for ANOVA. So with the Z scores, we produced a Z. With T test, we produced a T. With ANOVA, you produce an F. And I can't tell you why, um, because I have no clue what the logic is. Like, why didn't they call it an A test? They call it an F test, okay? And so an F test, structurally speaking, builds on the same concepts of a Z and a T. Only we're not looking at mean differences anymore because we're not focusing on means, we're focusing on variance now. So now we're still looking at a ratio of group differences on the top divided by reasonable error on the bottom, okay? 
So we're, but again, we're changing our focus to variability now instead of using the measures of central tendency that our previous formulas looked at. So ultimately, our t-test looked at, at difference, at mean differences divided by standard error. And now we're looking at variance differences divided by what we would call um, error, but we're gonna break down error a little bit further. And we're gonna say, okay, what kind of variance differences should we expect without any treatment? And that's gonna include variances that we might already see within, within the, the groups themselves, right? So we call that within treatment errors. So if I'm doing a gender, I'm, I'm comparing um, height differences between men and women, then I'm looking at, hey, there's gonna be automatic variances. Not all men are the same height, not all women are the same height. Um, and then you're gonna also have differences between men and women directly. So I'm kind of dissecting all of that in an ANOVA and I'm saying, okay, um, accounting for what's reasonable for all these variances, what's left over, do I have a treatment effect? Just like in a t-test, larger t's meant that you're more likely to be in the critical region and therefore have a treatment effect. The same is true for an f-test. Larger f's indicate greater variance differences and therefore a treatment effect, okay? If it obviously it can fall in the critical region. And that's what we're doing. So since an F-test or an ANOVA can also be used on two levels, the question comes up, well, why not just use a T-test? Why do we want to use, you know, if I have groups, why don't I just do a T comparing group one and two, group two and three, and then group one and three? Because remember that our alpha level, our 0.05, is our probability of making an error and coming to the wrong conclusion, right? Saying that we had a treatment effect when we didn't. And I had a 5% risk of doing that first t-test. And I also have a 5% risk of doing that for every test comparison thereafter. So if I'm using an ANOVA to analyze a group up here with three groups, right? If I were to do a t-test, it's a 5% error when I'm comparing these groups, 5% error when I'm comparing one to three, and then 5% error when I'm comparing these groups. That means I have like a 15% probability of being wrong. So, if, you know, if I'm, you know, trying to do a surgery and like, I, well, there's a 15% chance that like this might be the wrong surgery for you. Do you want me to go ahead with it? That's kind of a high risk, right? So instead I can just do one test that still limits my risk of making an error to 5% and what the app does. So what we do is we call, uh, we call your individual alpha level, a test-wise alpha level, right? So I set that alpha level based on what risk do you want in a type one error. For the purposes of this class, we're using 0 0.05. Know that some studies use 0 0.01 and some studies even have it more constrained and use 0 0.001. The experiment-wise alpha is that all of the combined risk so if I go back up here and I'm saying, okay, I have 5% here, 5% here, and then another 5% here, that experiment-wise risk is now 15% instead of just the five. So test-wise is just for the single test, and then experiment-wise is your risk of type one error for the entire experiment, okay? And since that's substantially greater, if you do a bunch of small, little t's, we stick doing one f test. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about what the f test is doing. So we have our total variability. Imagine it's like a pie. The alpha or the analysis of variance, f test now, is dissecting that pie and cutting it into pieces. And it'll start by cutting it into two pieces, our between treatments variance and our within treatments variance. 
our between treatments is what's the difference between our three groups, right? So how are one and two different? How are two and three different? How are one and three different? So how are those groups different from one another? Our within treatment variance is looking at within the treatment condition itself. So within group one, how are they different from one another within that group? Within group two, how are they different from one another within that group? So if I'm looking at gender, um, the between is saying how are men and women different from one another, right? Uh, and then within treatment is saying how are men different from one another and how are women different from one another, okay? And what we're doing is dissecting that through our formulas, again, to determine if the remaining variance reaches a threshold of significance that says, yes, our treatment did in fact work, okay? So um, taking that same concept, um, breaking it down into a little bit more depth um, with our narrative here, our analysis of variance is kind of segmenting that, uh, the entire variance into separate components. And we will break it into between treatments variance, which is looking at sample mean differences, similar to what we were doing with t-tests, right? How much difference exists between the two groups. And then um, those can be either kind of naturally occurring unsystematic differences, because you have different people in each group, or they can be due to the treatment effect. And then the within treatment is looking at how much variance is occurring within each individual group, okay? Okay. So in terms of formulas, I'm gonna start plugging in some numbers and then we're gonna break down uh, some of the notation, okay? So our overall conceptual formula is we're looking at variance between treatments divided by variance within treatment. So same as we were doing uh, with a t-test and a z-score, we're looking at differences between the means or the population and, and the sample, only now we're looking at differences in variance between groups, and we're dividing by kind of what's left over. What are just the systematic differences or sampling error that exists, right? That's what we're still doing. So conceptually, it's still building on that same basic formula structure. Okay, now what that means is we're going to take our sum of squared deviations from our between groups um, and our sum of squared deviations from with a, within our within groups, right, to calculate our variance. So this is going back in sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom is kind of your basic formula for variance. So that's going back way back to measures of variability in chapter four, I believe, okay? And don't worry, because I'm going to give you your cheat sheet. Um, if you'll notice, you'll, ha you'll have a cheat sheet for every module. So you don't have to spend your time memorizing these formulas. You can really fast forward if you don't really care to understand the logic and the formulas. This is really just to help break it down so you understand where we're getting the basis of the formulas, okay? So um, we're, we're going to dissect that sum of squared deviance. Uh, excuse me, sum of squared um, sum of sum of squared deviations, and we're going to break it into between and within, and we're also going to dissect that degrees of freedom and break that into between and within. Again, between is comparing men and women to one another. Within is looking at differences between the men, differences between the women. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna now. Um, analyze that. So plugging in the formulas, this is what this means. Notice you're seeing some new notation here, right? You're looking at a grand total. That's a new concept you're not, you haven't been exposed to. You're looking at a treatment total. Again, a new concept you haven't been exposed to. So here's some new notation that you're going to have to familiarize yourself with. When we look at K, we're looking at the total number of treatment conditions. So if it is looking at comparing men and women, that's two treatment conditions, right? If we're looking at comparing men and women and non-binary, that's three treatment conditions. Let's say we're looking at um, a 
placebo group, a 500 milligram group, a 1,000 milligram group, and a 2,000 milligram group, that's four treatment conditions, okay? So K is referencing the number of levels or treatment conditions you have for each factor or each IV. N is looking at the number of scores in each of those treatments. And then your larger N is looking at the total number of scores. So let's say I have four levels. I have five people in each group. So my K is four. I'm gonna have N is gonna equal five because I have five people in each group. So little N equals five. And then the larger N is my all of my N combined. So that's gonna be 20 because it's five, 10, 15, 20, okay? T is looking at the total treatment group. So if I'm looking at the score for men, right? And then the score for women, and then the score for non-binary, they're all gonna have a T score, which is their total score. All of their scores combined for that treatment condition. G is the grand total. So what was all of the scores combined for all the conditions all together, okay? Um, and then, of course, going back to our notation we've already learned, looking at our sum of squared deviations and M for mean. Each group will have its own mean. Each group will have a standard deviation. Each group will have its own variance. Um, and then there'll be an overall variance, uh, just like we saw with the t-test, okay? Okay. So here's our formulas. Um, starting with doing our sum of squares total. And then remember, we're partitioning that off to sum of squares with, within and sum of squares between, okay? And then our degrees of freedom total. And then again, we're partitioning it off between and within. Um, so just like we do with our uh, variance and we dissect it out, we do the same thing with degrees of freedom. Notice you have two different formulas, right? You have a total degrees of freedom, which is N minus one. You have a between treatments degrees of freedom, which is K, the number of levels that you have total minus one. And then within the treatment conditions, you have a, a new formula, which is looking at N, our total N minus K. Okay, so pay attention. It's giving you the little n, it's talking about just the number of participants for each condition. When it's giving you the big n, it's referencing the entire study, okay? So we're not just looking at the big n um, as it refers to a parameter or population anymore. It applies to our sample, but it's looking at our total group participants, okay? Okay. Um, also, our formulas are reliant upon our mean squared. And so our mean squared is going to be calculated using our sum of squared deviations. It's going to be our variance between, our variance within. So, and our ultimate formula is going to be looking at mean squared between divided by mean squared within. Uh, so I have to know how to calculate um, this is our final formula, but I have to know then how to calculate mean squared, which requires that I know how to calculate variance, which requires that I know how to calculate sum of squared deviations, okay? Um, and notice that you have all these different degrees of freedom formulas, so you have to pay attention which formula, this is the degrees of freedom between formula, the degrees of freedom within formula. So now there's three formulas for degrees of freedom in an analysis of variance complicated, right? That's why we don't do this shit by hand, and we put, plug it into SPSS, and we let it calculate it for us, okay? So don't sweat. SPSS will do it all for you. So if you're ready to have a nervous breakdown right now, because you're like, shit, how am I going to learn all this stuff? Don't worry about it. Understand what it is conceptually doing, right? Focus on that. Don't get lost in the formulas and the statistical notation. SPSS will track that for us, okay? But I want you to understand is the big picture, what is it doing? What are we using ANOVA for? When do we use it for? What ANOVA do we use with what design? Um, what types of research question are we asking? And then how do we interpret the data? How do we enter the data into SPSS? 
run the analysis, and then interpret it. And when you run the analysis in SPSS, it produces what's called a source table for you. You can create a source table too. Um, when you're doing your manual calculations, you can plug them into a source table. But a source table takes all the different components that are part of that larger formula, and it tells us in an organized way, here's our sum of squared deviations, our degrees of freedom. These things were used to calculate our mean squared, which was then ultimately part of the larger F formula, okay? And we then will use this information to report our statistical evidence and our results paragraph and to draw conclusions then about whether our treatment worked or whether it didn't work, okay? Okay, so me personally, I would say now's a good time to take a break. Go get a snack, go for a walk, go back, add some detail to your notes, um, start reading in the chapter, line it up with what I've been saying, if you have any questions, go back and rewatch it again. But I think now is a good time to take a break for you. Um, I think, you know, I'm going to take a drink too, because cheers, because that's what I need to do too. <laughs> okay. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what the distribution looks like. Remember when we first learned about z-scores, we learned that it's a normal distribution, that bell curve that we've been so used to seeing our entire academic lives, right? Well, our F distribution looks a little bit different. Our F distribution is a positively skewed distribution. So F um, is, an F value is going to be positive always, okay? If the null hypothesis is true and there's no difference, it's gonna be one, okay? Because you're saying you're between group differences divided by your within, you know, your differences between your treatments divided by error, it'll just be one, okay? And because there's gonna, there's not gonna be any differences between the two treatment conditions. So it'll just be one. And, um, the closer it is to one, though, the closer it is to the null, okay? So when you have smaller F values, so as we know in stats, size matters, right? We've learned that the bigger the T, the better. We've learned that the bigger the D, the better. Size matters, okay? So Fs matter too. The bigger the F, the better, okay? So we need big Fs out there in the world. And when we have big Fs, that's telling us there's a treatment effect. So larger Fs mean that it's further away from one, so it's closer to the critical region, okay? And we want um, it to be in the critical region because that means there are significant differences. So larger Fs, you're more likely to reject the null hypothesis. Smaller Fs are less likely to be significant and you're more likely to fail to reject the null or retain the null hypothesis, okay? So what we will see though is again, it's positively skewed where we're gonna see um, on an F distribution, you're gonna see that it's gonna pile up around one and then it's gonna taper off toward the positive end of the number line, okay? Um, when you do have uh, an F distribution, the shape of the F distribution changes based on the degrees of freedom. And so that is actually um, a huge, a, an influencer of what it actually looks like. A larger degrees of freedom, the more closer they're gonna cluster around one, so the more peakedness or kurtotic, if you'll remember that terminology from previous chapters, it has more kurtosis um, when you're, your degrees of freedom are larger. And then it, when they're smaller, it's gonna be a flatter, wider distribution. So it's not gonna have as much peakedness or as much kurtosis. Uh, I do want to, um, I'm gonna actually go to our Canvas course shell. And I am going to um, pull up in our modules, I'm gonna actually pull up our appendix. And if you go into our appendices, 
I'm going to introduce you to the F table. So you all remember the unit normal table for z scores. Then we introduced you to the T distribution table for our T test. In our T distribution table, we needed to calculate degrees of freedom. We needed to identify whether it was a one-tailed or a two-tailed. And then the column that we used was dependent upon what alpha level we were utilizing, okay? Now, we, oh, then also we used our Fmax test and that was to test homogeneity of variance for our T-test. Now we're moving on and we're using the F distribution test. Notice this is positively skewed. Your answers are always positive. You also need to calculate degrees of freedom to figure out your boundary F score for the critical region. And you need two degrees of freedom. You need your numerator, which is your between groups, your between degrees of freedom. And you need your denominator, which is your within degrees of freedom. So remember I showed you those three formulas. You have the total, the between, and the within. You need to calculate the between calculate the within, and then you also have to know what alpha level you're using. The F distribution table is based on two potential alpha levels, 0.05 and 0.01. And the 0.01 are in boldface, and the 0.05 are not. So notice here, you have the 0.05 is the, the just regular font, and then the bold font is gonna be the 0.01. So, we are typically going to use 0.05 in this class, so you'll pay more attention to the normal font and not the bold font, okay? And every boundary will be different depending upon your degrees of freedom. Notice that if you only had a degree of freedom for between of one and a within degree of freedom of one, your critical region has to start at 161. So the smaller degrees of freedom correspond to smaller sample sizes because your degrees of freedom formulas are still all related to sample size. So smaller degrees of freedom means you have smaller samples, which means you need a really huge effect to find a treatment effect, right? We know that when you have larger samples, they're more representative of the population. So that means you need a smaller effect to find a treatment effect or smaller F. And so notice that as you start to get bigger and your degrees of freedom get bigger, now your, your values for your F scores are significantly lower and meaning your critical region, you can have values that you can find values in your critical region um, at much lower thresholds than you could otherwise, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna go back now to our lecture. And so um, I've introduced you to our F distribution table. So you've been able to visually see it. Uh, you know you're gonna use your between groups degrees of freedom for your numerator, your within groups for your denominator, and then your alpha level, whether it's gonna be 0.01 or 05, you're gonna find that intersection. So let's say I had a degrees of freedom of, uh, let's say two, and my within groups degrees of freedom, let's say is eight, okay? So two and eight. So I'm gonna go to my chart. No, sorry, I'm gonna go to my chart and I'm gonna say two and I'm gonna go down here to eight. And if I'm using a 0.05 alpha level, my boundary for my critical region is gonna be 4.07, okay? So I look at that intersecting point of the degrees of freedom and that lets you know what your boundary is for your critical region. Just like you can draw that out for your Z scores and your T scores and mark that point for your critical re region, I recommend you do the same for an F test and an ANOVA. Only now instead of doing a bell curve, you're only gonna have a positively skewed distribution on one side for your critical region, okay? Okay, um, let me go back. And now I'm gonna walk you through the steps of a hypothesis test. So if you wanna take a quick break, you can, um, or you can just plow through. But for the hypothesis testing steps, nothing's changed, it's the same. 
We state our hypothesis and our alpha level. We locate our critical region, which requires that we calculate our degrees of freedom. We compute our F score and go through all those steps, or we just use SPSS to do all this shit for us. And then we make a decision. Are we gonna reject our null? Are we gonna fail to reject our null? Were there significant differences weren't there? And then I'm gonna add my fifth one, you report your results using APA format and the template that I provided you, okay? And so um, how we report those results is we say um, F, and then we tell what degrees of freedom, uh, including our between groups degrees of freedom and our total degrees of freedom. And then we tell what our final computation resulted in was our p-value, our probability of getting that statistic less than 01, less than 05, greater than 05, or greater than 01? So was it in the critical region or not? And then instead of doing, um, instead of doing in t-test where we had r squared, we're going to introduce you to what's called partial eta squared. So r squared told us what percentage of the variance was accounted for in our um, study based on our treatment effect, right? And the, the partial eta square does the same thing. It tells us what percentage of variance is accounted for by our treatment. And that's the effect size. Again, just like we learned with t-test, effect sizes are calculated only if you find significant differences. So if the F test is significant, you also need to calculate an effect size and report your effect size with your statistical evidence, okay? Okay, um, and then let me see. You can also find all of this information in your source table. So if you go up here um, to look at a source table, it tells you your degrees of freedom, right? It also tells you what your final F score was. What's not on your source table is your effect size. You have to calculate those, okay? Okay, um, and then let me see. Here's our formula for our effect size. And so our effect size is gonna be our sum of squared between treatments divided by our sum of squares total. Again, if you go to your source table, it gives you that information. So you can plug those into the formula to calculate your eta squared. So if your F value is significant, you're gonna do that extra step, or when you're in SPSS, you're gonna click the box and let it do it for you, okay? And then let's see, what else do we have? Okay, so when we're talking about conceptually um, for an ANOVA, the numerator is just really looking at differences between the treatments, just like we were looking at with t-tests and z-scores. What are the mean differences between our groups? And conceptually, that's what an ANOVA is doing for us as well. The denominator, though, is looking at what that variation is in, in, within those groups. So it's looking at kind of that error variance. Um, and error can be, uh, you know, just natural discrepancies that exist, not accounting for treatment effects. Um, so that can, either, that can either be due to, you know, differences between the individuals or just sampling error, just unsystematic differences that we can't predict. Um, we can try to put formulas on them to estimate them for us, um, but most definitely, conceptually, it's still doing the exact same thing as a t-test did for us, okay? Now, where it becomes uh, a little bit, um, well, similar to a t-test, larger sample sizes are going to increase the size of our F, so it's always good to work with at least our rule of thumb is 30 people per group. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're choosing a sample large enough to find a treatment effect if it exists. But remember, sample size is not factored into our effect size. So just because sample size helps us find the treatment effect 
it doesn't in any way influence the magnitude of that treatment effect, okay? So um, ANOVAs can be used when we have, uh, let's say we have three levels uh, and you only have eight people in one level and 10 people in the other, that's okay. Um, we don't wanna have huge differences in sample size from, from group to group, but a small discrepancy is okay, okay? As long as it's not extreme. So you want to hold to equal n as best as possible, but it doesn't have to be exact. Now, where ANOVAs get really complicated is because the ANOVA test itself just says, was it in the critical region? Were there significant differences between treatments? Did our were there significant differences between the placebo, the um, 500 milligram, and the 1,000 milligram? And that's all it does, is it tells us whether there were significant differences. It doesn't tell us which group had higher significant or higher differences. It doesn't tell us whether there was significance between the placebo and the 500 or the placebo and the 1,000 or the, the 500 and the 1,000. We have to do what we call post hoc analyses. Post hoc analyses are post, they're after the fact. So it's after we've done our F test, after we find significance, now we have to do a post hoc analysis and figure out where those differences lie. Is it that men are different than women? Is it that men are different than non-binary? Is it that women are different than non-binary? We have to figure that out. And so we have to dig in deeper and do these post hoc analyses. So the ANOVA allows us to control that experiment-wise uh, alpha overall, right, that experiment-wise error, but we still have to dig into the post hoc analyses to find out where the differences are exactly, which treatment conditions are more effective than the others. Uh, and so that's the disadvantage of an F-test. It just tells us there's differences, but it doesn't tell us where the differences are, so it has to be partnered with post hoc analyses, okay? We're gonna introduce you to a couple of different post hoc analyses. No, there are literally dozens, but for a basic introduction, you're only gonna learn two in this class, okay? Um, when we're talking about post hoc analyses, post hoc analyses also have their own error, right? We also have the risk of making mistakes and committing a type one error in a post hoc analysis. And so, um, you should know that in SPSS, depending upon the analysis you're running, uh, the post hoc analysis might come out as what's called pairwise comparisons. So those words can be interchangeable. When you see pairwise comparisons on an SPSS printout, it's referring to post hoc analysis, okay? And it's comparing those individual treatment groups two at a time, so they're in pairs, so we can look at uh, which groups are different from one another. And what we're effectively doing is we are now we introducing our own risk of making a mistake for each of those post hoc analyses. So we want to choose post hoc analyses can, that can minimize the risk of making a type 1 error. And the two that you're going to learn is the two keys test and a Shafe test. Uh, Tukey's test is not as conservative. Shafe is more conservative. So if we were to, to draw this out on a distribution table, the critical region for Shafe is going to be further out and smaller. Tukey test is going to be closer and bigger. So we can sometimes find a significant Tukey test, but then when we look at the Shafe analysis, it says, yeah, that's not significant enough for us. So just because something says it's significant in a two key doesn't mean it says it's in a chaffe. But most of the time, if it's a significant chaffe, the two key will also show that it's significant. So how do we calculate those? Um, each one has its own formula. So you're gonna utilize a new um, distribution table um, in your appendices for the two key test. And that's the honestly significant difference test. You're going to have a Q table here that you're going to look up and plug into the formula. Now, I don't want you to stress out because you already have 
a mean squared, right? You've already calculated that for your F test. These two, you already have these for your F test. So you don't really have to calculate anything new, but you do have to look up the Q in the, in the corresponding um, table. So let me take you to that. Um, here is your Q table. Again, you need your number of treatment conditions, degrees of freedom for your error, which is your within, uh, and then you find the corresponding value, whether that is boldface is 05, or oh, excuse me, boldface is 01, light faced or regular font is 05. So you find that Q value, plug it into plug it in here to your formula, plug in the mean squared within and the n, uh, and that'll tell you what your 2p test is, okay? And your Shafe, you're gonna do, you're, you don't have to use any supplemental table. You just calculate your mean squared between divided by your mean squared within. And these numbers come from the two groups that you're comparing to one another, okay? And, um, and so, Again, if, if it's uh, significant, then you'll know that group one is different than two, or you'll know which one is different from one another. And we'll practice this in class together. Um, I'll take, take you through some demonstrations. At this point, I will not require that you manually calculate these things. We can utilize SPSS for our calculations. Uh, and, um, but I do want you to be familiar with the formula, what goes into it, the logic and the concepts behind it, okay? Ultimately, there is a relationship between ANOVA and T-test. So F equals T squared. So whenever, remember that an F um, test or an ANOVA can be done for two levels. So if you run, if you're comparing two groups, men and women to one another, and you run that analysis through a T-test, and then you turn around and run it through an F test, your F answer will be the squared value of your T value, okay? They are directly related to one another. Um, they're both really looking at, you know, how far apart are the means from one another for a T test and the F test is looking at how far apart are the variances from one another. Um, and then we're, we're uh, but they, because as effectively conceptually we're measuring the same thing, the two tests are directly related. We're also evaluating just are the means the same or are they different? It's the same. So I don't want you to be so stressed out on ANOVA. A lot of people think, oh my gosh, the complexity is just off the charts, and it is. But at the same time, the formulas become off the charts. Let SPSS manage that for you. Stick to the roots. If you felt really good after t-tests and you understand them, then know that f-tests are just a little bit more complex than t-tests, but they're ass assessing basically the exact same thing, okay? Uh, so I don't want you to get so stressed about it. Adi additionally, um, we're used to finding what's in the critical region to make a decision, right? We're used to using these diagrams. The same holds true, only it's now looking at a skewed diagram. Instead of it being a normal distribution, the distribution is positively skewed. That's okay, and that's because all of our F values are positive, okay? So typically, when we're talking about, obviously we don't know what our critical boundary is because it's gonna vary. It's gonna vary from um, test to test depending upon what our degrees of freedom are. But this particular illustration is showing you uh, for a test that would have resulted in a T boundary of T.101, because T F equals T squared, then, then our corresponding F boundary is just gonna be square, T1, T.101 squared, that's it. Because there's a direct relationship between the two, okay? So don't forget that. And don't get so stressed out. Going to our assumptions and what criteria needs to be met in order to um, reliably trust in the validity of our conclusions or results. First of all, independent observations, right? The, the outcome of, of um, you know, being 
participant one should not have any effect on participant two, okay? Also, uh, we want, we're assuming that they're being sampled from normal distributions. There's nothing inherently um, bizarre about those distributions. And then additionally, they have equal variances. So that homogeneity variance that we were talking about in t-tests is still very much part of our ANOVAs and our F-tests. Uh, we are using that Hartley's F-max test to test homogeneity. And so when we're interpreting our SPSS results, um, we're assuming as long as we didn't violate homogeneity that we're reading the results from the equal variances assumed, okay? And we also know that where you guys have heard about it is homogeneity variance. Another term that we can use to describe that is homoscedasticity. So when, two, when the variance is the same between two groups, they're, they're said to be homoscedastic. And when they're different between the group, two groups, they're said to be heteroscedastic, okay? So homoscedasticity, um, that's just another word for the outcome for homogeneity of variance, okay? And then finally, I just want to kind of give you a taste. Right now, we've been discussing a one-way independent measures ANOVA. In chapter 13, you're going to learn about a one-way repeated measures ANOVA. Repeated measures ANOVA is when we have the same people being measured repeatedly. We're also going to learn at the end of chapter 13 about a two-factor design. And a two-factor is when you have two factors or two independent variables you're measuring at the same time. And a two-factor can be when both factors are independent measures, both factors are repeated measures, or both fa one factor is repeated and one factor is um, between. And so I want you to, to kind of, I'm introducing you to this notion. Here we have therapy technique where we're comparing a uh, group one has one therapy method, let's say drugs, group two is looking at talk therapy, okay? So this is a between groups design. I have different people getting drugs and different people going through therapy just with a talk therapist. Uh, and I wanna see which one is more effective at let's say uh, um, impacting depression, right? I'm gonna, then I also have another variable or another factor, which is time, and I'm looking at measuring them repeatedly. So before, after, and six months later. This is a repeated measures or within subjects variable. This is a between subjects variable or an independent measures, okay? This group right here, are the therapy one group, so our drug group, this is their scores before therapy. This is their scores after therapy, just for the drug group. This is the drug group scores after six months. This now is the talk therapy group before. This is the talk therapy group after therapy. And this is the talk therapy scores after six months. I also, not illustrated on here, will have a total before score, total after score, and a total six months later score. I will have a total talk therapy score and a total drug therapy score. And when I'm looking at main effects, I'm looking at the main effect of therapy. Did the type of therapy have an effect on depression? So the main effect of therapy type on depression, I would compare the two total scores. Um, the main effect of time, uh, did, did the time have an effect on depression scores? I would compare the total before, total after, and total six months later. When I'm looking at it a two-factor analysis, I can also look at those two interactions. And I'm gonna look at what we call the cellular means and see how the pattern changes within the cells to see if there was an interaction effect. So we're gonna ratchet up the complexity when we get into chapter 13. I don't want you to expend your energy and get all stressed out on the formulas in chapter 12. Focus on the 
concepts, know what an ANOVA is, know what it means when I say one factor versus two factor, know the difference between a, a within and a between subjects, right? Um, design, know the relationship between the T and the F, know that an F uh, distribution is a positively skewed distribution. No bigger Fs are more likely to be in the critical region. Um, know that kind of stuff, okay? But in terms of the formulas themselves, don't get caught up and stressed in that because we're gonna learn SPSS and we're gonna let SPSS do the manual calculations for us. And most research would never be done with hand calculations. They will always be done with some sort of research technology tool, and in this case, SPSS, which is the most common research tool used at our neighboring CSUs, including CSU San Bernardino, CSU San Marcos, and even Fullerton, okay? SCSU also uses um, SPSS, so, uh, and your neighboring uh, UC systems use it as well, okay? So I hope that's not too stressful for you. I hope it helps a little bit in combination with the reading, in combination with our lab activities where we'll focus on practicing when to use ANOVA, how to do it through SPSS and how to interpret it. I hope you'll come away with a really good understanding and you'll feel good about yourselves, okay? Um, and otherwise, I will look forward to seeing you back in class. Have a good one.